Some of you are going to find yourself after you've eaten, you've just uh, had a cup of tea or coffee, and often after lunch, we can begin to wilt. Do you understand what I'm saying? I've preached for long enough now to see every expression under the sun from the front, from various places. You would not believe what you see from up here, I can tell you. I've seen everything. The most depressing sight I've ever seen when I'm preaching is, is, is when somebody is trying to gr- agree with what I'm saying, whilst at the sta- same time trying to stay awake. <laughs> That's thoroughly depressing. You know, the kind of wilted look where the person's almost over to one side and they're going like this, desperately clinging on for consciousness while I'm trying my level best to preach a message from my heart. Please don't do that. I'd rather you just have a nap, right? Please just have a nap, go to sleep for a little while. And then the wonderful thing is the Lord is well able to bring you back round to consciousness for just what you need to hear at that given moment, okay? But yes, it's amazing what you see and what you hear, and so beware, my eyes are on you all. (laughs) It's great to be back. I want to thank Sally Richardson again for the invitation. I was due to speak on a subject I'm called Going Out the Gate to Jesus. And just yesterday, I felt the Lord change what I should speak upon, which isn't always comfortable because you do want to, you prefer to speak on what you already have and you might have prepared, but we're not here to present something for entertainment or something that's just polished, what we want to do is give you what the Lord wants to give you, because only what he wants to give you will profit you. Anything that comes from the preachers out from themselves will not be really of benefit. But that which is from the Lord to you, well, that has worth. That goes into eternity. That has consequence. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so we need to pray that the Lord would speak his word. You know, when you get that word and you know the Lord's spoken to you, there's the quickening of faith with it. You know, this is from the Lord for me. I hope that will happen to you this afternoon. I hope you've already experienced something of that even today through our brother's message this morning. But let's begin, shall we, with a word of prayer. For without the Lord, we can do nothing. Let's ask that he would lead us, shall we? Well, dear Father, what a privilege it is for us to be together as the people of God. And Lord, we don't want to take this opportunity this afternoon for granted, knowing, dear Lord, that there are many believers all around the world that have been scattered and chased away because of persecution. And Lord, we just want to pray that you would uphold our brothers and sisters in trying times in various nations. We see the escalation of persecution in India and Pakistan and other places. Lord, would you uphold our brothers and sisters, we pray. And Lord, as we are afforded this opportunity to freely come and look at your word together, we do pray that it would please you to minister to each one of us by the Holy Spirit. We look to you for enabling. We ask for anointing. We pray that you would deliver us from anything that would distract our thoughts away from what you would put in our hearts. Lord, give us readiness of heart to receive what you would bring to us. And we ask for the anointing of the Spirit and the pressing home of truth into our hearts by the Spirit of God, even today. Lord, we need the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we ask, Lord, that you would not leave us to ourselves. We ask for your animating, your even the intonation in the voice to emphasize what is of you by the anointing of your Spirit. Oh God, we pray that these words would not fall to the ground, but rather you would have mercy upon us. We look to you for all these things, Father, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, if you have your Bibles, and I trust you do, that you're not entirely relying on bringing a phone to church. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not massively into that. I understand sometimes people do that, but I, I, I understand. It's not, I'm not going to condemn you now and ask you to leave the meeting if you haven't got your pages with you. We're not getting legalistic here. But there's sometimes it's really helpful to have a Bible with you, right? Rather than just... Uh, it's, it's amazing what can happen when you have a Bible with you, even wherever you go. I've had two occasions recently where I've had my Bible with me, and two people have spotted it, separate occasions, and it's opened the door for something marvelous. And let me just tell you the story as I divert before we even begin. That actually, a few weeks ago, I was spending some time out seeking the Lord, it's good to get away from the busyness of life and seek the face of God by yourself with fasting if necessary and to really call on the Lord that he would speak to you in, in, in various situations, isn't it? Well, I was going to go to a place called Ashburnham and some of you know that conference center and I was hoping to go there and they rang and said there was COVID had gone just haywire at the center so I couldn't go. So I had to cancel that and instead of going to Ash Burnham, I, I signed in to a Premier Inn. Bit different from Ash Burnham, right? But anyway, I went to a Premier Inn. So the first afternoon evening of spending some time in prayer and in the word and so forth, very good, um, had a nice quiet night's rest, got up in the morning, and then about 11 o'clock in the morning, the fire alarm goes off in the Premier Inn. Can you believe this? I think this is meant to be my three days, you know, I'm really looking for, and the fire, I've never been to a Premier Inn when the fire alarm goes off. 11 o'clock, I just go, I have to go out, step, and can you believe it? Some people were still in their pajamas at 11 o'clock, come in. At, anyway, that's another story. So they come out anyway, and we all go down the stairs. And I'm down the stairs, and I took a few things with me before I left, because you don't know whether it's going to be a real one or not, do you? So I got my phone, I have my wallet, I had the key, the, the card to the door, because if you don't have that, you're not getting back in. And then I had my Bible, okay, so I got my Bible, I went downstairs, went out, and there's a guy fiddling with something electronic, or with, to do with the, the electric, or whatever, like the alarms, I wouldn't know where to begin with these things, and um, he said, it's all right, it's all right, it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's not the real thing, twice a year, we have to do these alarms, once every six months, I thought, once every six months? And the very time I'm here to pray, this alarm has gone off. Anyway, I went out the door, and somebody was standing there. He'd obviously just come out the building as well. Big guy. And he looked, and he saw I had a Bible. He said, is that a Bible? I said, yes. He said, you a Christian? I said, of course. Are you? He said, yeah, yeah, and I was just, he got talking to me about where he was with his life and how he'd been to a, a Pentecostal church a number of years ago, got baptized, but realized it was sort of prosperity gospel and all this kind of thing. And he was very sort of like, I thought, I don't know where this guy is spiritually, really, I'm not sure. We got talking a little bit, and he said, have you heard of the Jehovah Witnesses? I said, yes. I said, oh dear, what's coming? He said, well... He said, tomorrow, um, tomorrow I'm due to meet up with the Jehovah Witnesses. There's a lady who works here who's a JW, and she has said to me that I've got to get involved. What do you think of the JWs? I said, you, you need to run a mile, buddy. You go that way, you'll never come out. Don't do it. Stay clear. His eyes were wide open. He said, really? He said, listen to me, you've got to do it. He knew by this time I was a pastor of a church. You've got to not get involved with them. He's going, really? He said to me, I can't believe this is happening. He said, my, my induction interview is tomorrow. He said, can you talk? I said, let's talk. And so we went to the coffee room next door. I'm going to be up in my room praying and this alarm has gone off. 
Amazing. And anyway, so I said, let's go, let's do it. And, and then he bought me a coffee, which was even better. I didn't even have to pay for the coffee. And then we got chatting away for a good hour or so, hour and a half. By the end of that conversation, he had texted his friend and told her, I'm not going to the JWs and I never will. Full stop. God intervened in that moment. But if I hadn't had this in my hands, the conversation may never have got started, right? Amazing what can happen. Carry your Bible around with you. You'd be surprised what looks you get, but who cares? You know, it's better to... Another opportunity I have was in, a, was, in a, was, was in a coffee shop, a different one this time, and I have my Bible with me, and this young lady, she asked me, this was all recently, she said, is that a Bible you got? I said, yes. She said, oh, that's interesting. I said, are you a Christian? She said, no. She said, I'm into paganism. And she was steeped in paganism. I mean, occult center, I mean. But she said, I have read the Torah. I said, you've read the Torah? How do you know it's called the Torah? She said, I'm half Jewish. I said, wow, that's really interesting. I said to her, what's your name? She said, Bethany, which means a lot to me because that's my daughter's name as well. House of Dates, House of Figs, what the, what the name means. We got into a good conversation. I was able to leave a Ray Comfort track with her. Amazing what happens when you have your Bible. Carry something with you. Let people know that you belong to Jesus. Be, can I put it like this? Be proud to be a Christ, one of Christ's men or women. Wear the badge of honor. If people despise you, Christ is worthy of that, right? When I was young and 16, I went to college and I used to wear a cap. Do you remember the Coca-Cola advert? It said, Coca-Cola, it's a real thing. And I had a cap saying, Jesus Christ, he's the real thing. And I was about 16 and I used to wear this into lectures, right? And, pe you know, people would <laughs> were not, not, didn't know quite how to handle me. It's great that Jesus Christ be the one you, yeah, speak about, talk about. It's amazing what happens. Now, I'm not asking you to buy that cap, okay? <laughs> but I'm asking you to strongly, strongly be, you know, I remember being young and just smiling. I belong to Jesus, and I'm proud of that. Amen. 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 Let the world curse and do what it is. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Praise the Lord. I'm going to mention one verse to you. Does that sound familiar? From the book of Proverbs. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Proverbs 9. Proverbs 9. I'm going to read one verse to you. Proverbs 9 and verse 10. Brothers and sisters, Proverbs 9 and verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight, is understanding. Let me read it again. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight, insight. Lord, we do ask that you would give us insight this afternoon. And we want to meet with you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We want to press on with you today. All oh, raise our gaze Godward and help us to learn of you through this time together. May your anointing be on my speaking and all our hearing. And may the word that goes forth be mixed with faith that we might be changed by the word. We ask these things, Father, to your praise, and indeed, all for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. As I mentioned before, I was wanting to share with you um, a message that I gave at our own fellowship back at Cool Farm a week or so ago, 
um, a couple of weeks ago on going out the camp, going out the gate to Jesus. And just yesterday, I felt impressed upon me to do something else. And what I feel impressed upon me to share with you this afternoon is really a burden that we as believers, as believers, as churchgoers, need to come back literally to God himself. Now that might sound really obvious to you, but you'll be amazed really how little we really focus on God himself and his incredible attributes. And I believe we need to think about who God is and everything must stem from that view. Everything in your life depends on how you view God. It really does. It profoundly affects the way you live. It profoundly affects the way you think. It profoundly affects the way you see life in general and politics and everything. How, what is your view of God? We live in a day, even within the church, where I believe we need to get back to who the God of the Bible really is. This is so essential because all our decisions in personal life and church life flow from this. It was A.W. Tozer in his book called Knowledge of the Holy who said this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. That's very well phrased, isn't it? That's in the book, The Knowledge of the Holy. Read it again. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. We live in a church age in the West, friends, that puts a very much of a high value on, the, on man himself and on his thoughts, and even within the church, we've come to a point, haven't we, in church life, where we're so concerned about what men or what people think about us outside the church, we try to adjust church life to accommodate what we think people outside the church want to hear. You understand what I'm saying? This actually happens. This actually is happening. In many, many churches, even in the UK, it's like, how can we bring people into our churches? And so we try to use the music of the world. We try to use the philosophies of the world and we mix them and merge them in with holy things. And God does not like mixture. Right? He doesn't. Now, I'm not saying that, therefore, what the Lord requires of us is to be as old-fashioned as we possibly can be to combat worldliness, okay? That's a false form of religiosity. It's not spirituality, okay? Um, you know, we won't sing any hymns before 1842 or whatever, you know, th all of that is nonsense, right? That's not what we're trying to um, accelerate here. What we're saying is that so often within leaders' minds, they're thinking, how can we get people into our churches? And so we try to accommodate the ways of the world within the church. And the fact is, when we do that, we don't find the blessing and power of God in our meetings. Because the Lord will not condone anything that didn't originate with him. Okay? Nothing goes into eternity that doesn't start with God. Okay? Nothing. It will be tested by fire and found to be burnt. Only that which really originates with God and comes from the heart of God will truly pass through into eternity in, in the ages to come. That's essential for us to realize. It was A.W. Pink 
I'm going for the AWs today, aren't I? This is, this is A.W. Pink. He said this, How vastly different is the God of Scripture from the God of the average pulpit? This was back in the 20th century. This is 1940s, this man is writing these things. Not that he was recognized at the time, A.W. Pink. Most prophetic ministers aren't. It's only after they've died, everybody thinks, ah, oh, what we had. <coughs> Pink was one of them. But he said very clearly, how vastly different is the God of Scripture from the God of the average pulpit? Why? Why? Often because the fear of man is greater in our hearts than the fear of God. We are more concerned with making God palatable to man than man realizing that one day he has to stand before God. And there needs to be a shift and a change in the thinking of the average pulpit in the church in this nation if there's going to be a change in the pew. That is for certain. Unfortunately, for a number of of generation of preachers now within this country, we have been chiseling away at an image that we can make of God that is something that we can still maintain as to be biblical, yet at the same time avoids certain aspects of the character of God so to accommodate the unregenerate man. That is sinful. That is sinful. Brothers and sisters, I think it's one of the most grievous things for a minister to stand before a congregation and not want to express the whole nature of the God that they say they love. And I don't want there to be any aspect of the character of God that I try to shy away from sharing with the congregation for fear of what they might think of me. At the end of the day, how much of this is self-preservation anyway? Got around my pay packet. Don't want to lose my job. It's better to lose a job and be with Jesus. Much better. Much better. Our great need within the church is to get back to who God actually is. The malady of the hour is due to the fact that we have lost sight of the God that we say that we worship. We've lost sight of his attributes, of his personal perfections and divine character. And if you go, if you went into bookstores, Christian bookstores by and large have closed down now. But if you look online at the popular Christian books of the day, what are they? They're all about how you can be helped if you have this in your life and you have that thing about God in your life and you and you and you. And who's writing books about God? Nobody. Man-centered Christianity. That's what we have today. But who is speaking about God? Who is speaking about who he is? Because what man needs is not simply the answer to his questions. Often our questions don't deal with our problems. <laughs> Even Jesus didn't answer people's questions. Sometimes he answered their questions with another question to expose what was in their heart. And that's what they needed to hear. What is the great need of the hour? Well, we need to do this and we need, yes, but if you and I have a faulty understanding of who God is, that firstly needs to be corrected. There are those that believe God is a God of love, but they do not believe that he is a God of judgment. That is a very prevalent in our day. There's a kind of preaching that seems to be going around to me, a kind of hyper-grace preaching where God just loves you as you are. It doesn't matter how you live. 
just to come as you are, live as you are, live as you live, just sing your songs. It's almost like just God loves us. It doesn't matter how we live. But where do you find that in the Word of God? You see, it's an abuse of one of the attributes of God. You're actually changing the love of God into lasciviousness. And you're changing the idea of the grace of God into lasciviousness. You're saying it's a license. But God's love is never like that. How easily we allow the atmosphere of the spirit of the age to impact upon our minds within the church and sometimes without, listen, without even realizing it. Without even realizing it. What is the safe measure to prevent your mind being molded into the day that you live in? How are you going to be able to recognize the atmosphere of the world coming into the church, the thinking of man impacting upon the church? How are you going to be able to recognize it? Only if you are totally immersed in the word of God. I guarantee if you set your heart to be in the word of God, your battles will begin. It's amazing how many times you open the Bible and the phone rings. You open the Bible and something happens with the children. One of them has thumped the other one. Just at the time you got to this wonderful passage in Romans. And you're just about to read it and, Dad, he did this, she did that. What is it all about? The enemy wants the people of God to be away from the word of God because the word of God reveals the word of God. And if you have a revelation of God, you will find that you will be changed. It's impossible not to. You say, of course it is possible. No, it's not. You try telling Isaiah it's, it's possible to see something of the holiness of God and remain the same. Impossible. Yeah? Can't do it. Can't do it. You tell Paul that you can see something of the glory of the Lord and just be the same person you were before you saw the glory of No. You tell John, who leant on Jesus' breast, the man very close to Jesus, yet on the Isle of Patmos, when he has the vision of the Lord in glory, falls before him. You can't be the same. Oh, for more God-touched men in the pulpit. God-touched. Not perfect men. God-touched men. You can have orthodoxy even in the pulpit, but orthodoxy without the power and the Spirit of God forcibly applying the word of God to the preacher, you will find that it will come across as merely something cerebral. It will be head knowledge. The God-touched man will never simply sound as though he's assimilated information about God. He will be careful when he speaks of God. He will be careful how he portrays God to the congregation. And he will be solemn when he speaks of the holiness of God. He won't be dull or boring. The idea that to be spiritual means you have to be boring is a complete misnomer. But there's so few, there's so few who actually have had a glimpse of something of the character and power and beauty and majesty of the Lord. For those who have had such experiences, 
they can never speak glibly about them. They are always to be rendered in a holy manner because they were holy times. Meetings with God. When was the last time you had a meeting with God? When was the last time you decided, I'm going to drop everything and go to a Premier Inn? <laughs> well, forget the Premier Inn. Go somewhere and meet with the Lord. I want to encourage you to do it. We need to get to know the Lord. Tozer again said this, the low view of God entertained almost universally among Christians is the cause of a hundred lesser evils everywhere among us. He went on to say, it is impossible to keep our moral practices sound and our inner attitudes right while our idea of God is erroneous and inadequate. If we would bring back spiritual power to our lives, we must begin to think of God more nearly as he is. I suggest that's true. We have introduced as leaders to countless congregants the idea that God is simply in heaven for us. This man-centeredness is everywhere, isn't it? I, I, self-esteem. We've got to build up our self-esteem. Where do you read that in the Bible? I can think of a few words of what the Bible says about self. I can't find too many places where it tells me to build it up. My self doesn't need building up at all. It's full of itself. It doesn't need any help. It esteems itself very highly, thank you. And it needs to be dealt with. My dad, I remember years ago, he said, instead of calling it self, self-esteem, self we should call it selfish steam. I think that's good. I quite like that. My good old dad. That was a good phrase, that. Selfish steam. I've got in a lot of trouble for saying what I've just told you. I've had people even in, well, I better not tell you where from, but I've had people write to me and say, I'm really not happy with you talking like, about self-esteem like this. Why? Why? Ego is everywhere, isn't it? Everywhere. Somebody has to explode their ego. This wretched ego. This self-esteem. No. Do you know, when Isaiah saw the Lord, he didn't build up his self-esteem very much. Do you know what he said? Can you remember? He says, woe is me. That doesn't sound like a modern evangelical phrase, does it? When was the last time you had somebody come into your meetings and actually under the preaching of the word of God say, woe is me? You never hear it. Why? I suggest to you, it's because at times in the church we preach a comfortable God. Our God is a consuming fire. Brothers and sisters, you can't, we can't play with God. Amen? We don't play with God. I have Christians who joke with me at times. They try to joke with me about spiritual things, and I just want to back off. You can take the mickey out of me all you like. There's a lot to take the mickey out of. You know, you can, you can talk about my ridiculous hair or just how I lose things at times. Uh, whatever you like. You can joke and say, my beard isn't as good as my brother's over here. But the moment you start joking with me about God, it's over. I'm not going to joke about God. I don't want to be flippant about God. 
It doesn't mean that we're to be somehow at feeling at distance from God. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not talking about a wrong sort of fear that somehow is has within it superstition. I don't tread here. I don't touch this. I don't do this. What if God comes down on me like that? I'm not talking about that kind of attitude at all. That is a wrong type of fear. But Dennis Clark once said this, the wonderful thing about the fear of the Lord is, is there's no fear in it. That's good. That is good. Fear involves what? Torment. God does not torment his children. No, 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 no. And we need to be careful even as preachers when touching on such things as the judgment and wrath of God that we don't instill a wrong kind of fear into the people we're preaching to. Because remember, for the believer, they've passed from death to life. And as it says in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 10, and pretty much again in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 9, the people of God are not under the wrath of God. We are not. We are not. Glory to God. The most important thing for you concerning issues is that you're not under the wrath of God. There are, the unregenerate are. But praise God, we are not appointed to wrath. That's the wonderful thing. That wrath to come. Well, that's another matter altogether. We need to come back to what God says about who God is. Don't you agree? You see, it's the views of men that spoil things. You remember in the book of Revelation, you have the Laodicean church. Laodicea basically means people's or the laity's opinions. And we have the opinions of men in the pulpit when what we need is the word of God in the pulpit. Men surrendered to the word of God, preaching not their own views, but the counsel of God. Because people don't need my opinions. You don't need my opinion about you. It may be that I'm right about you. I'm certainly right that my brother's got a bigger beard than I have. <laughs> but that's as far as it may go. But the word of God abides forever. And if God speaks, it's a different matter altogether. So the preacher must be filled, not with his own ways, not with his own opinions, not with his own estimation of your need, but with the word of God. I might get it right once every four years. Come here, and say, I give my own opinions. Maybe one year I might get it right. And you might say, oh, you're absolutely right. I am like this. But that's not what we're here for. The minister must be submitted, submitted to the word and counsel of God. Otherwise, you won't be blessed because all you'll have is the minister. What you need is the Lord. <laughs> well, moving on. What does the scriptures say? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, richly. Husbands, Yes, love your wives, that's right. Husbands, share with your wives what the Lord has shown you in the word. Wives, share with your husbands what the Lord has shown you through the word. As you commune together with the word of Christ, sharing each other's bread, you will begin to find the word of Christ dwelling in you richly you say i'm on my own find another one 
There'd be another person, perhaps, you can talk with over what the Lord has shown you in the Word. But you see, this, when the service ends on a Sunday morning, and everybody goes back for tea and coffee. We always call this a time of fellowship because it sounds better. It sounds more spiritual if we call it a time of fellowship. A lot of the time, it's not really a time of fellowship at all. It's an opportunity to talk, at least for some folks, about what's going to happen in the match of the day at 3 o'clock in the afternoon or what's going to happen next week or what I did the other... You know, just talk. But the Lord is completely out of the equation. But when the ministry of the word goes forth, it's not just so that we have a sermon and then we think of everything else but the sermon when we're having our tea and coffee afterwards. The whole point for actually having teas and coffees afterwards is so that we might commune and feed each other on what the Lord has been showing us, even through the message. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we did it? Not what's my opinion of so-and-so's message. Well, I didn't think he was so flamboyant today. He wasn't really going for it like he should have done. No. What has the Lord been speaking to you? What did he say to you through that? Afterwards is not an opportunity to become diagnostic experts on how well the preacher brought his message across. That's not the purpose of preaching. The purpose of preaching is so that the word of Christ can dwell in us richly. I wonder what would happen. I'm serious. I wonder what would happen in this country if every God-called minister, anointed of God, got into the pulpit, and began to preach through experience with the word of God, began to preach the attributes of God. I wonder what would happen. I think our services would alter, altogether change. I think there'd be more of a reverence for God in our meetings. I think there'd be more of an appreciation of the need to be right with God. You see, it's not just saying, you're a sinner. You need to put this right. You need to put that right. When Isaiah saw the Lord, he knew he was undone. You don't even need to say a word. He wasn't preached to. He saw the Lord putting God in the vision of the people as the word of God speaks. I'm not talking about any kind of image that's created by the preacher. I'm saying preaching what God says about himself in his word, bringing that to the people of God, the spirit of God applying the reality of that to the congregant. They soon start realizing they can't play with sin in the house of God. But not only that, Let's leave the negative about behind for a minute. What about the positive? People will begin to love the Lord for who he is. You'll lose some people. Of course you will. It's inevitable, isn't it? People who come to church don't, don't mean that they're there for the living God. So often we're there for ourselves. Sad to say. But in the true preaching of who God is, the true believer's heart will be warmed and want to know this God more and more and more. Indeed, haven't you found that, friends? If I asked you, those times when you've been in the presence of God, something, let's say, of the love of God, that attribute of God, the love of God, impacted upon your heart at some time. Have you ever experienced that? You should have done. And maybe some of you are still asleep after lunch. But the fact is, some of you should have experienced at some point in your Christian life, the Lord actually loves me. And you experience the knowledge of that love impacting upon your heart. Now, having experienced that, do you then want any less of that God? Or do you want more? You want to know more. 
You wanted to come into more. Every element of light that God in his grace and his mercy commands to flow down into your soul. You want more light and more light and more light. The Lord is wonderful. You want to get away from sin. But it's not all about legalism. It's not about, I must do this, I must not do that. No, it's about, I don't want to dishonor this glorious God that has revealed himself to me. I don't want to grieve his precious heart. It's not, I must do this, I mustn't do that. It's relationship. I don't want to hurt the God that has revealed himself to me. Amen. Oh, that we might know him more. You say, well, tell us more about him. Let me preface anything I'm going to say with this. No man knows God as he ought. And the danger is when we get a little bit of the knowledge of God, we automatically think we know more than we actually do. And one of the pitfalls of young men, perhaps, they have an experience of the Lord. And then people put them on a pedestal before they're able to handle it. It goes to their head. They go into ministry and they're undone. They can't handle the opposition and they fall into error. If you know something of God in your own experience, let me say this. To quote Job, you've only touched upon the fringes of his ways. You're on the outskirts of this person, this glorious God. And no one of us will ever come to the end of the knowledge of God for all eternity. All eternity. You can get into a hobby. You can get into a sport. You can get into a craft. And it will give your interest and entertain you up to a point. But it can never satisfy your soul. You will come to the end of what you can experience of that thing, but you can never come to the end of your knowledge of God. Throughout all eternity, we will be getting to know God. All eternity, think. And this short life that we live, that is kind of like on probation, preparing us for when we really come into all that God has for us. We know in part. We prophesy in part. But we shall know him as we are known. And yet, we will never come to the end of all the glorious attributes of our glorious God. You don't want to get to heaven and think. I don't want to sort of think I, I'm in the, you're just on the brink of entering heaven and you've never really got to know the God that you're going to spend eternity with. Friends, the deception of the enemy is to tell you that it's boring to be in the presence of God. There's other things more fun, and your flesh will rail against it. But I'm telling you this, there is nothing on this earth more glorious than being touched by the living God. Nothing, absolutely nothing, compares with the Lord revealing something of himself to you. Because that which is given to you then becomes yours forever. It will not be taken 
away from you. You say, how do you know that? Mary chose that good part. Dear brothers and sisters, it, when the Lord meets with you and enfolds you and speaks to you and touches you and unveils his life to you, there is nothing left in this world to you that is worth spending time with. It loses its effect. You see it for what it is. Transient, empty, nonsense, some of it. And just to be in the presence of God. Didn't the Lord say that to Moses? Come up to me on the mountain and be there. Be there. Be there. None of us knows God as we ought. So what does God say then about himself in his word? What does he say? In Exodus 15 verse 11, we read this. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness? Awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders. Twice the question is given, who is like you, O Lord? And then implying, of course, that there's nobody like God. Friends, there is no one, not one person, not your closest friend, not your most enjoyable moment that compares with God himself. Twice, who is like you? The inference being clearly nothing, no one. And then... Moses gets to the distinctives. What is it then about this God? Well, you see, he's majestic in holiness. Holiness speaks of that attribute of God that means that he is utterly other than any other being that there is living or dead. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. He is the thrice holy one. He is the one who dwells in unapproachable light. He is holy. Separate, other than us. God is holy. We, by nature, are not. This is what undid Isaiah. The seeing of the holy attribute, the attribute of God's holiness, brought the revelation so strong to the servant of God's heart that he says, I am a man of unclean lips. Friends, don't think when Isaiah said that he was the most worldly person there was under the sun. It's not so. It's not so. He is a man who knew something of God. But in the light of the revelation of God, he realizes how unclean he is. One thing that will happen to you in the experience of the presence of God is the awareness of his purity. And dear friends, when that purity affects your heart, I have to say, it's like precious medicine to the soul. Because we, like Lot, find ourselves vexed by the uncleanness, 
that we see about us, do we not? On boards, on screens, the clothing people wear, it's everywhere. And then the Lord comes to us and he just impacts our hearts with the reality of his holiness. And for the believer, it has a purifying effect upon his soul. It's medicine to the soul. Majestic in holiness. Secondly, awesome in glorious deeds. All the deeds of the Lord are glorious. There's nothing he does that is arbitrary. There's nothing that he does that is somehow imperfect. Everything that God does has something of glory attached to it because it emanates from himself. It would be a denial of his own character to produce anything other. When you look at the sunrise in the morning, what does it do for you? The hymn writer put it like this, something lives in every hue Christless eyes have never seen. It's true. But the sunset and the sunrise, I remember years and years ago, I was out early in the morning with my eldest son Isaac, who's now 13. When he was young, he decided to become a nocturnal creature. And he decided that he would uh, uh, keep his mother and father up, feeling that they obviously didn't have enough understanding of the verse that we need to stand by night, you see. I think his view of that verse is wrong, but um, he kept us up. One night, one morning, very early in the morning, I took him out in the car because we couldn't get him to sleep. And I drove around and I suddenly saw an incredible red sky in a way that I've never seen it before. And then I realized I needed petrol. So I stopped off at the petrol station. And as I was filling up, there was a gentleman right next to me filling up from his side of the petrol tank. And I said to him, have you seen that sky? And he looked round, he looked back, and he said, yeah, like that. <laughs> and I just said, you can't tell me there's not a God behind that one. And then just went into the pay for the petrol. Didn't think much of it, got back in my car, drove round, and to my astonishment, I see this man looking up with his arms folded at the sky. I think it can't be the same man, can it? It's amazing what will happen if people will stop looking at the pavement, begin to look what God made. These glorious things are but the fringes of his ways. This is the God that we worship. Awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders. Our God is a God of wonders. I could go on and on about the character of God. Psalm 90 verse 2 says this, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now, what about this aspect of God's character, his eternal nature? Think about this for a moment. Think about this just, just while you're trying to hang on for consciousness and wondering when I'm going to finish. Just listen to me for a moment. There was a time where there wasn't any creation whatsoever. No creation. 
No angels to sing the praise of God. There was no earthly creatures. There was no earth at all. No heaven, no earth, just God. And God didn't create the world because he needed us. It's very important to realise this. During eternity past, God was alone in need of nothing and self-sufficient. You had the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the communion between them all as one was glorious. And God, in his perfect purposes and in his great grace, created as he did the earth. But in times eternal past, God was by himself. From eternity to eternity, he is. God. Nothing changes. Everything is still under his control. He sovereignly reigns. He's omnipotent. He's over all. He reigns. He rules. He's omnipresent. He's here. He sees everything that goes on, even today. Everything. Nothing escapes his notice. And where can you flee from his presence? Oh no, what a comfort that is to the child of God. To the unregenerate, they run from the presence of God and seek to hide. But to the regenerate, they're hidden with Christ in God and they know the Lord is with them. Wonderful. Do you know him? Do you remember in the Song of Solomon when the Shulamite woman was asked, well, what is your beloved more than any other? I wonder what you would say if I actually asked you that. I wonder what would happen if I asked the regular member of an evangelical church. Okay, far away. Tell me what your beloved is more than any other beloved. And wait to see what the response is. But you see, to the person who knows the God of the Bible, there's a flow that comes, right? Because your heart Loves the God of the scriptures, yes? When somebody says to you, tell me about him, you're just like trying to catch your breath because you can't believe you got the opportunity. That's the way things should be, right? You remember the time when you were first in love with your wife or your husband? We're not going to discuss that now, but... You could speak about them an awful lot, right? Everybody around you was thinking, oh no, she's on about him again. Or he's on about her again, right? But it was, it was natural. Your heart was full. And you see, the Bible says it's out of the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. Your speech gives away what's in your heart. It's an irreversible law. You might be able to keep it in for a while, but in the end, it comes out. Well, we should be like that with God. Do we speak about his attributes? You say, well, I don't really know them. They're all in here, brothers and sisters. You have the same Bible that I have. I don't know the attributes of God as I ought. I don't know God as I ought. I want to learn with you. I want together with you be a company of those who are known to want to know God. Oh, that I may know him. It's all right, I'm going to be ending soon because I'm nearly a quarter of the way through my message. <laughs> Skip the other half. Right, we've got to come to an end. What does the Bible say? What else does the Bible say about who God is? Look what this verse says. I'm going to read this verse to you. Does the Bible anywhere say, God thinks you're just amazing. You're his creature. You, you need to think big thoughts about yourself as a Christian. You need to big yourself up. You need to realize you are a champion. You need to take hold and realize you can take on the world. Does the Bible talk like that about men? 
This is the kind of modern talk we get within some churches. Listen to what the Bible says. Isaiah 40, verse 22 and 23. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness compares with him? Doesn't have a modern ring about church, does it? But this is what the Bible says about God. The New Testament is just the same. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the scriptures say, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honour and eternal dominion. Amen. So then, what is the right response for us? Jeremiah 9, 23, 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Oh, friends, the church is sick through lack of knowledge of God. Oh, to come back to the God of Bible. And this is eternal life, that they know you, Jesus says this to the Father, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's John 17, verse 3. On the negative side, Isaiah 1.3 says, The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Isaiah 5.11-13, to 13, you can read it in it. It goes on to say in verse 13, Therefore my people go into exile for lack of knowledge. They don't know God. They don't know God. So we come to the end. You might have come today and you thought, what has this got to do with Israel and prophecy? I came here today under the idea through dear Sally Richardson that I would be hearing a message, something to do with Israel or prophecy. What has this got to do with Israel and prophecy? And the answer is everything. Amen. Everything. In the prophetic scriptures, if you look at Daniel 11 and you look at verse 32, which has prophetic overtones for what's to come, go on reading in Daniel 12, you'll read this. Those who know their God will be strong and do exploits. Or to quote it, from another version, the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. You can know everything from a head knowledge to do with the end times, and when it comes to the end times, be completely out of your depth. That is true, and I feel there's a danger that we can just be taken up with thinking, as long as I know everything about the end times, that makes me fit and ready for the end times. It doesn't necessarily. We need to study the end times. We need to know what the scriptures say. I'm going through the book of Revelation at Court Farm on a Thursday morning at a Bible study, slowly and surely, because I believe we need to know what the scriptures say about the end times. But listen to me. When it comes to times of turmoil and difficulty, the important thing is that you know God, Amen. that you know him, that you've come into an experiential knowledge of him. And it's the knowledge of God that will enable you to stand in the evil day. So, brothers and sisters, we need preaching back in our pulpits. We need preaching again on who God is, don't we? 
don't we, on his omnipotence, making no apology because we love God for who he is. And then sinners will be convicted. The righteous will be glad. People will be drawn to Christ. And there I will, I believe, be, even in part, there would be a move of God. There would be at least a corrective, something of reformation within some of our churches and of getting rid of things that are not of God. Oh, may the Lord help us. Brothers and sisters, let us press on to know him for his praise and to his glory in all our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear Father, we want to thank you so much that you are a great and awesome God. And Lord, we just want to confess how little we know of you. But we just want to say the little that we know is irreplaceable, absolutely irreplaceable. Please, in these days of such darkness, confusion and lies, shine your light into each one of our hearts for a greater seeing of the wonderful God that we know. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The Lord bless you all. Praise God.